This episode of Cello Chat is brought to you by Carriage House Violins of Johnson String Instrument. Please visit us at www.carriagehouseviolins.com. Great, and we are live. Hi, everyone. My name is Jan Vogler. I'm very grateful to be here today, and big thank you to Cello Bello, uh, everyone who's behind the scenes, of course, Paul Katz, but also William helping out here. So thank you all for... Uh, being here and I was told that it might take a few minutes before people come in so I will talk a little bit about where I just came from and what I'm doing right now before we dive into the actual subject today uh, cello sound which I'm very very interested and I hope you are also very interested and there's lots to talk about and uh, the 25 minutes for me at least will fly by and I hope there will be something interesting for you but I just came uh, this morning I got up at five and flew from Orlando, Florida to New York, where I'm right now in my apartment here. And I played the Dvorak Cello Concerto in Orlando with my wonderful friend, uh, Eric Jacobson, a conductor and also cellist, and um, the Orlando Phil at their beautiful new concert hall, Steinmetz Hall at the Dr. Phillips Center. It's really the greatest hall now in Florida and one of the greatest halls in America. So I hope that there will be another destination for classical music um, in America will bloom and maybe some of the 120 million um, yearly tourists to SeaWorld and Disney World will also stop by the concert hall and listen to classical music. So um, in general, I'm working on two pieces right now intensively. This was the Dvorak and at the same time I have the, the Elgar Concerto um, on my kind of music stand, if you want so, or iPad. And um, I'm going to go to Hong Kong soon to play the Elga Concerto there with the Hong Kong Philharmonic and Jaap van Sweden. And I have worked, used the last few weeks to rework my Elga a little bit and find new ideas and also new concepts. I like to do that uh, every few years, completely rethink a piece, try new fingerings, new bowings, new ideas, and also think about the piece and update my my ideas. That's a lot of fun. And in Elgar and Dvorak, as you can imagine, we are talking a lot about cello sound and cello sounds we want to choose and very specific sounds that are required for the different passages and the different characters. So um, I think that's a good transition to uh, our subject today. I hope you can hear me well. I hope I speak clearly enough and loud enough. I'm not so routine in doing this because um, I usually do uh, lectures or uh, masterclass in person, and uh, this is a new thing for me, but I, um, I'm very excited about it. So uh, I would like to start the talk and talking in general about how do we actually start producing a, a cello sound. I think it's first comes with the concept and idea of sound. And since we are mostly, I think, talking here to uh, professional cellists or students or aspiring uh, professionals, I think um, for me it's very, very important that we have a very clear idea what sound world we want to produce on the cello. So mm -hmm. everything starts really in the head, not even in the ear, really in the head, an idea, uh, a concept of sound. And for me, that was very much inspired by a uh, few great cellists I grew up with, uh, not so much hearing them live, but on LP. So when I grew up uh, and started intensively uh, studying cello in the uh, late 1970s, um, there were was uh, I grew up in East Berlin, and my grandmother sent me from the West. She sent me a record with um, Leonard Rose with Schumann Concerto and Shalomo and Philadelphia Orchestra, and that record really formed my idea of sound. I really thought that the sound uh, Leonard Rose produced on his Amati cello was very much um, something I could relate to and I could dream of producing on my instrument. There was a center of sound, there was beauty, there was color, there were uh, lots of different um, dynamics and um, articulations and phrasings that go with the sound. So. Uh, he was my maybe sound hero of my ch childhood, although I never had the luck to hear him live. Uh, it was all on LP later. I got other recordings with him, especially his chair music recordings with uh, Isaac Stern and Eugene Istomin, the trio recordings, which inspired me very much. And at the same time, I had another record with Dvorak Cello Concerto with Gregor Piedigorsky and Charles Munch. 
again Philadelphia Orchestra. And um, Pedigorsky produced a very different sound, a looser, less uh, focused sound, but uh, of enormous charm and beauty. And uh, at least on record, again, a cellist I never heard live, um, for me, a sound that uh, spoke to me and had so much charm and so much, um, um, I would even call it information in it or storytelling in it um, to be observed. And the third uh, cellist I like to uh, mention was Emanuel Feuermann. And Emanuel Feuermann was in a way my great grandfather teacher, meaning that uh, Julius Klengel taught Emanuel Feuermann, Emanuel Feuermann taught August Eichhorn, August Eichhorn later in Leipzig also taught Feuermann again. So his former teacher, they, they had this kind of mentor-student relationship, switching roles through their, of their lives. And um, my father and also my other, my father Peter Vogler and also my other teacher in Berlin, Josef Schwab, both studied in Leipzig with Eichhorn. So this is a kind of a little bit of a direct descendants. And um, I grew up very much with this ideal of a very clear and very, um, elegant cello sound and I must say that um, the view of um, heroes, one coming a bit more natural through my teachers, one um, coming uh, through, um, through this uh, record with Shilomo and Schumann and then Pedigorsky also reading his book and, and dreaming of traveling with my cello around the world. So there was a lot of influence uh, from, from this side. And there was of course the Russian cellist Daniel Shafran who we as students were rather told stay to don't go there too much because it was unusual how he uh, played with vibrato and pressure and um, although we know now he was a total genius in my childhood uh, he was also a little bit here and there the devil because how he used vibrato wasn't to everyone's taste and uh, we were not so um, I would say not so encouraged to to learn from him for some reason which seems strange in retrospective but it's important to know and also we are not that much um, inspired by the russian school in east germany also strange although some uh, students went to russia and um, studied there directly and of course then they got uh, inspiration from the russian school so big difference between east germany where i grew up in west germany west germany was very much influenced by the french sounds by uh, tortelier fournier navara um, i mean the french had amazing cellist Jean Dron. after the war they had four great cellists and Germany had basically none after the war and so um, uh, West Germany was heavily influenced by especially Navarra teaching a lot and also by the sound world of these great French cellists uh, so I think this just a little bit to give a, a perspective where my sound ideas come from and as I said, sound starts in the head, goes to the ear. What do we want to hear? I think we need to set a standard. The first thing for me is always to have a standard for your sound and to train your ear to be looking out for this kind of sound. And if you have that, you have already won a part of the battle because if you practice a lot and you use your brain and your imagination to practice well, I'm sure there were cello bello chats about practicing a lot. So for me, um, if you have a very clear idea about sound, you will get someplace. Uh, of course, there are lots of things one can um, uh, help. And I think uh, I have an unusual approach here. Again, we're going from the more rough information into more detail. I will later talk about right arm, left, left hand, but I would like to talk a little bit about how the sound and our body communicate with each other. So a sound idea, in my opinion, comes from the ear, but our body also suggests certain ideas of sound. So for example, I'm built, yeah, I would say I'm not the most flexible person and um, some, some other people have very flexible joints and they will produce very different sounds. And uh, if you have a little bit less flexible joints, you have some advantages and some disadvantages, but the sound can be quite direct and also um, projection can be, can be very good. So I think we, we should at some point think about our body a little bit. What are our strengths? Are we more flexible, less flexible? Do we want to produce a darker sound? Does that come natural to us? Or does a brighter sound come more natural to us? And do we maybe think about uh, getting familiar, more familiar with the sound our body suggests a little bit? So 
I think uh, we, we talked about the brain, the idea of the sound. We talked about the ear demanding a certain sound. And now we talked about the body producing a certain sound. And I think uh, from these three big elements, we can negotiate uh, definitely if we have a standard and uh, expectation from ourselves, we can definitely neg negotiate a cello sound that can be exciting and interesting. And um, I think let's talk a little bit about the two hands and how we produce uh, sound. So I would like to start with the right arm, of course, because that's our main sound producer. And I must say, I've been always more fascinated by the right arm technique and the possibilities of the right arm and, and uh, uh, our right hand than the left hand. Because for me, uh, the singing of the cello is really where we can maybe express so much of the repertoire. And uh, one of my favorite pieces is Shalomo by Bloch. And you can imagine this is 90% sound colors and um, phrasing. So really the right uh, bow arm is very, very important. So I think uh, if we start uh, producing a sound, I think it's important that theoretically, and we can of course have variations, but theoretically we can start a, a sound right away without any delay on, and the quality and the dynamics we wish should be immediately there. And I think if you, yeah, somebody's posting Colidra, that's a very good piece to, to, um, to, to try this with. Of course, if you start Colidra with a... You want the sound basically to speak right away with the quality you you want to have. And uh, if I try this without my left hand, let's say the, the right arm, we watch out that the quality, the dynamic, and the um, yeah the, um, the the whole sound world appears right away. That means our index finger has to be ready, and uh, we have to know how much pressure, which contact place we want to touch the string. And if we have this under control. We will absolutely um, right away produce the sound we want. I give you an example. Yeah, I see a lot of questions here to this, so maybe we can already take some of these questions in. Uh, William, tell me if I answer too many questions, but I would love to answer some questions while we go. Sure, How do you for sure. How do you practice forte sound at the tip of the bow? Yeah, then we're coming to this point. So let me explain a few basics. I think if we uh, choose, we have to choose between contact place, speed, and pressure. Those are our three elements we can uh, define a sound with. And if we choose the right contact place for the right speed and the right pressure, and there is usually just uh, one choice. So I give you one example, a very typical example. You have probably seen it many times. I play one note on a low contact point. I need a pretty high speed. I do the same note, same dynamics on a higher contact point. I can double the length of the note, the same quality. And here again, I can double it again on an even higher place. And that's the same quality of note I can produce on three different contact places. I just changed um, the bow speed and um, basically the cello suggests you to change that bow speed. The pressure was exactly the same. And now, of course, I can also do variations in pressure and can give more pressure and intensify the dynamics. If I go to the tip uh, to answer the question from, I think it was, um, uh, where was the question that many prac uh, 40 sound on the bow? There's no name. I think maybe Raphael. So, uh, on the tip, we have to make sure that we are at the pressure we need, which means we have to uh, uh, have to be in a pronation um, position on the tip. Have to be able to apply the pressure at the f at the maximum we want right away. So on the frog, of course, the weight of the frog helps us. On the tip, nothing helps us. The bow is much lighter. We have to be able to apply the pressure, and we'll have a powerful. So we could actually start the Dwarja Concerto in down bow. Or up bow. Well, I never started the Dwarja in down with up bow, but to show we can produce the same quality of sound uh, on both uh, ends. 
But mm. again, I think key for a good sound is that we observe speed, pressure and contact places. I'm not going to go in too much detail because many of you know what that means. Many of you know uh, what the contact places do to us. But I see a lot of cello students who play in master classes for me playing on a low contact place with too much pressure that would sound like this instead of or so if you want to apply pressure rather move to the bridge and if you want to apply if you want to have a very airy sound you go more to the fingerboard and but then you can And so I think pressure uh, will never beat speed. So when you are in a big hall, you will very, uh, rather fast notice when you play solo that uh, for a certain speed and a certain contact pace, there's a maximum pressure. If you exceed that maximum pressure, the sound will get smaller again and will not stay uh, as big as you um, uh, want it. So very important is choose rather, in my opinion, a higher contact place than a lower contact place for solo playing. And when you do so, rather less pressure than more pressure. I give you one example. have played this also on a much lower contact place and with a similar result but not quite the same when I have the orchestra on the back the original dynamic is pianissimo I actually have um, a much better chance if I go a bit more to the bridge have almost no pressure and just control the bow speed use more bow speed for the notes I like better and I need more for example the upbeats in Dvorak we don't we, we, we are not in a Haydn so the upbeats are very very important so no. I can do this and can use the note which I want to emphasize. I can use more bow and less bow for the note I uh, want to play lighter. But very, very important if you want a good sound, and that's the subject today. To, today um, pressure can only be applied at the exact right contact place and with the exact right speed. Pressure is something can more destroy more than it can help, in my opinion. But of course, if you want to produce a big sound, we need pressure. But uh, watch out where you are. And I can give you a good example. For example, let's think about something very loud. Ah, yeah, in also Dvorak, maybe. <laughs> actually more pressure but again pretty high contact place very much speed and you can see with great violinists always they use a lot of bow speed and that's where you can also apply lots of pressure um, and when you have a low bow speed be very careful with pressure it will destroy or narrow your sound in most cases so I'm going to jump to some of the questions um, um, what is the question from I have a question from Jihun. I have a question about dealing with having to play with an orchestra and making your sound match the section and then switching your role into a soloist when a solo passage. Thanks. Well, I think um, very, very important in um, orchestra playing is that uh, again, that our uh, bow speed here uh, is coordinated with the rest of the orchestra. If our bow speed is uh, faster than the others, we will stick out. If, if our bow speed is uh, lower than the others, it will, it will not feel very good because we will not ring together with them. So watch your partners, watch the violins, watch the violas, the cellists around you. Uh, if you are the principal, you can watch the principals. If you're in the section, watch also your principal and see what bow speed he uses. I think that's the main element to adjust your sound to the, the section. When you play solo, watch how to go to the bridge. I always say not many good things in solo playing happen near the fingerboard, except maybe if we play a Bach. Or... But in ba 
Bach, we also have no competition. We have no one actually um, giving us competition. In the Dwarja Concerto, we have a lot of competition from the winds who um, play when we also play. And so even in the beginning of the Dwarja Concerto, we, we play with, with woodwinds together. So of the second movement. And I would say this is a good moment to maybe give a few tips about the left hand. I happen to think and that's not shared by all cello colleagues, also great cello colleagues, so please take it with a grain of salt. I happen to think that the pressure of the left hand makes a big difference. Um, I was trained this way to be, first of all, always with the left hand there first. So when you play a phrase where there's a... think that your left hand leads your left hand is there first your left hand develops vibrato and everything before you actually play the note and i think hugo becker said it it's a of course old phrase he said uh your left hand is your thought your right hand is your tongue never speak before thinking i think it's very correct the left hand has to be there before and has to get all the things out of the way that could disturb our sound with the right bow arm what do i mean by that i mean that and it's very nice if the uh, left hand can have an a vibrato amplitude, for example, that helps our bow speed, meaning that if I speed up my bow, I get, do again this example, or I give another example. Uh, I can hold you. speed my bow up which I find important I open my vibrato and I narrow my vibrato for notes which I think need less attention I do vibrate but with a na narrow uh, amplitude the same thing on a lower string if I want to make the sound round I slow down vibra my vibrato slightly and uh, best piece for this is uh, I think on a on a very important note, uh, vibrato should be applied as soon as possible when you start the note. The finger has to be in good contact before the note starts, and then you can actually form it with your left hand. And uh, my experience is that uh, a good contact, even some pressure, I actually like it very much to play with a left hand pressure on notes, which should, should sound beautiful with a lot of left hand pressure. And I have felt that the sound becomes more focused, more beautiful. It can be argued, but I do find that really very, very um, satisfying to have a very, very good contact left hand. Another advantage of a good contact with your left hand is that the vibrato never gets out of focus. It could totally get out of focus if you have a bad contact. Good example is maybe um, what? Do I do? Well, maybe um, take some Elgar. When I... my vibrato going like this that meant my left hand was a bit too loose for the vibrato amplitude I had and my finger was moving and if the finger moves it does not make any good for the sound so there's one advantage of having a bit more pressure is that your finger is fixed and you can now vibrate and will not lose your pitch nor the center of the sound so that all goes for for me for having a more um, um, yeah, more um, a contact with the left hand. I see a question from Denise here. Any tips for sound during double stop passages? Yes, uh, I think do double stops I practice in the morning. Double stops is also to stay loose. 
uh, you can always find one finger that is more solid than the other. I use usually the lower lower finger to which is a bit more installed and the upper finger is a little bit looser and can actually be flexible. Uh, I even practice double stops usually with a lower voice first. Uh, play it alone. I put both fingers down, but I only play the lower voice to make sure that's in tune. Then I can build my chord on the basically a uh, foundation. And um, good example. There's so many good examples for for double steps, but of course, very famous places. This is a very famous place. So this you could practice, for example. rather soft in the beginning and you will feel more stability because you have one voice you can really rely on and the second voice you can actually tune to the lower voice it, some people do it from the top note which for me I can't understand but I do the same thing with octaves also that I try to build them Obviously from, from a very from a very stable a bottom to make sure uh, you have your double stops uh, with one voice completely under control. Um, many places, as we know, and they're never easy. Um, I particularly don't like this one. In Elgar, but uh, if you practice the shift with the lower voice first, you will will notice it will be have a much higher chance of maybe up to 98% that always works when the lower voice is very stable. If you are with both flexible, it's it's uh, playing with two unknown um, factors, which is always hard. So there's another question. How do you practice a nice warm sound on the string? Well, I think when, for example, I do this before I go to the studio, when I have a studio recording, I'm always afraid of becoming too tense before because this the sound in the, the microphone is much more sensitive to stiffness in sound or to rigidness in sound. So I try to practice everything on the night before recording, usually very round and tame it a little bit and watch out that every transition is really nice and, and flexible. And you can, for example, use the third movement of Elgar, maybe if like... <laughs> can always watch out that everything that everything you find in the score and everything you planned like the dynamics so your contact places the direct connection for me is really dynamics markings in the score and contact place that you execute this relaxed and with a nice kind of overview over your cello playing and the warm sound comes usually from a rather relaxed relaxed approach so shoulders down shoulders have nothing to do with cello playing as we know very relaxed and make sure that uh, you don't have too much pressure on the frog and enough pressure on the tip always as we spoke about and the right contact place and relax and listen and you will get a warm sound vibrato for me always starts with the slower vibrato you can always speed up a vibrato, but what's very hard to make a fast vibrato slow. So I love slow vibrato, and I think it's a sell for everything to start. And once you get a great slow vibrato, you can always speed it up. I give you a good example, for example. But I think how I practice it is really like a... To make sure I can play with the slow vibrato and I can control the speed. 
And I think for a warm sound, as you uh, asked for, the slow vibrato is really the key and a continuous vibrato between the notes, meaning that you give the vibrato always to the next note. So uh, almost like... So the transition between the notes should be seamless and the vibrato should continue throughout all the notes. I think those are the basics that help you with the warm sound. So I think, I hope I answered this. Um, yeah, here was another question from Raphael also. How do you practice the natural vibrato? Yeah, well, that's for me, natural vibrato starts from non-vibrato. If you, if you really can, are able to play without vibrato, you will have a beautiful vibrato. But play without vibrato, without holding anything, playing without vibrato from a relaxed state. So... Uh, start with the smallest cell as that at least that was I was taught from the Leipzig school from that uh, Feuermann idea is that it starts from the smallest cell naturally and expands from non vibrato and I think that's also something I really love because when I play something without vibrato I try to almost have the feeling of vibrato already in it and then when I'm actually allowed to vibrate it just blooms naturally and if we can have this kind of natural uh, transition between non vibrato and vibrato we have exactly what it takes to um, to also imagine how music history happened in terms of vibrato for example Debussy writes in his sonata poco vibrato at um, uh, some place so uh, suggesting that he didn't actually count on you vibrating all the time and so um, we can really understand that vibrato was something that happened gradually in music history as a decoration like a trill and became something that is now so much um, a part of our daily life but we should always dial it back to what it was in the beginning a decoration and um, let it bloom from there and then it can be quite exuberant in the end and can uh, and help us uh, again listen to Shafran for that can help us to to enhance the music in a very exciting way uh, future run I hope I pronounce this um, um, name correctly do you have any thoughts and advice on how to express one's own personality and soul and communicate that effectively in one sound that's a very good question and that's actually what I was trying to go at a little bit I think your soul also your body and everything your desire your ear has and your it's almost like a desire for food for certain food I for example I like su sushi ja Japanese food and I can when I have good sushi like in Orlando there was a great joint and I I just enjoy so much that particular taste and I think with your sound is similar if you have um, a desire for a certain sound work on it if you notice you're not getting there think about what your body suggests and play something really natural and see what sound does your body have and try to negotiate again between your sound you hear in your ear and the sound your body produces because everybody is different and we should not work against it um, I've been playing for about now uh, 52 years the cello <laughs> and I have never really had any serious uh, injury nor back problems or anything and I think um, uh, if we can uh, if we can play long in classical music it's an asset because uh, nobody throws us off the stage uh, at age 30 like in in some pop music maybe or in, in a teenage band so so I think we we have the possibility to play long and we shouldn't work against our body so if you um, look for your personality and soul and sound. Um, I think first look for what's in your ear and what's in your uh, body. And then to communicate it, I think it is very much the idea of singing for someone or playing for someone. And you should definitely try to put all your feelings in your sound. And there we are again. We can take the beginning of Elgar Concerto, for example. Mm -hmm. You have to put your whole soul in it in this very, very passionate and also a little bit destiny kind of um, expressing uh, chords and uh, whether you put your soul in or not everybody can notice I give you an example and now 
another one. Sorry, it's Zoom. In a real Ruby, you would hear the difference much stronger. This first time I put my passion in it, and the second time I just played the chords well. I actually didn't play them much worse, but I didn't put my soul in. I didn't put my feeling in. We can practice that. I'm a big fan of during the um, during practicing to practice actually with your passion and with your emotions and tape it on a uh, iPhone and you will hear the difference. So when you have a certain expression in your mind for a certain place in the piece, practice it with the passion, with the soul and listen on an iPhone and listen or on a phone, whatever, uh, uh, or on a video camera, listen if you hear what you actually were trying to express. Uh, there's a question from Jason. I'm a fan of your recording with Bill Murray. How is your sound influenced by the singing and speaking qualities of the human voice? And did it feel different collaborating on that record? Well, um, Bill has one of the most uh, beautiful speaking voices I find. So when he reads something, he not only um, has a, a beautiful voice, but he, he observes all the qualities we should also, that's why I thank you for the question, he observes all the qualities we should observe when we are playing. He always creates something between his words. There is air that is magical and that tells a story. Same with us. We should watch out. We don't have so much time today, otherwise we could talk about the sounds between the notes, which is the biggest magic, I think, in music. And also, um, when he speaks, he makes very different beginnings for the notes. So maybe this is a missing point I made, I, I forgot so far in this uh, chat, uh, about the beginnings of the notes. We can make a very articulate beginning, or even harder, very sharp, or we can be very gentle, and watch out that we don't articulate the note too much. So all these differences with all the subtleties in between, big beginning, uh, less pressure afterwards, no beginning, more pressure coming in. So all these different ways of starting a word or playing a sound on the cello, Bill observes. So he it did, um, I heard him once read a Walt Whitman poem before we collaborated and um, it was so magical. He put this poem really in the room and you could walk around the poem and could see it in a 3D kind of way and that's my ideal about a slow movement on the cello that is so uh, like a sculpture in the air and that you could walk around it and look at it from different sides and i think on the cello we can do that very well if we connect sound phrasing and um, vibrato with different bow speeds and with the phrasing very very cleverly we can um, have this um, kind of um, yeah these different sounds and can tell stories with our sound Yeah, uh, William, help me out. Did I not answer some question? Um, oh, there's something from Guy Johnson. Hi, Guy. This is really nice to, to hear mm -hmm. from you. <laughs> uh, I think those are the questions we have for, for now. Uh, yeah. We'll keep uh, Mr. Vogler's welcoming any and all questions related to today's topic. So feel free yeah. to comment down below. Yeah. Well, I think, I think what the essential message maybe for me is that I wanted to use choose this topic to um, relate to you that I am very sure that sound, what we produce on the cello, is our maybe key um, uh, tool to express uh, things on the cello, in opposite maybe to a violin, which works with very, very different, um, uh, um, yeah, I mean, the violin has all the virtuosity and of course we have this on the cello too but i don't think it's as effective as this devilish um paganini virtuosity on the violin so the cello really has a quality if we can express that um place between um happiness and melancholy which a cello can do with a sound quite perfectly i don't think you can top that with you know anything on any other instrument it's it's something that's that's quite magical there are actually um is the question ah uh, okay the question is uh, was your development of sound on the cello difficult to play at first yes when i was young i had great teachers who could actually completely tell me 
about all the contact places, pressure and speed, and they syst systematically even wrote it on diagrams for me, and I could really learn how to search for the sounds I want to find. And um, so I, I was very lucky to have, um, uh, I think, very good uh, teaching about this. And I, f I find um, that sound is nothing that comes really natural to you, but in the end, it should sound completely natural. I think if we can forget that we play on a box of wood and can make it all alive and really completely fluid, I think, as suggested in the first theme of the Elga first movement, it's just a... Uh... Somehow I, I I love to practice this for hours to to find out until I lose this feeling of playing on the string until the whole cello vibrates and my bow actually swims on a kind of Rothko collar uh, bar or something like that. So so my imagination is always to lose this feeling of directly playing on the string and finding this cushion that um, makes you um, fly and the sound is somewhat. Um, flying in the air and not directly related to the mechanics behind it. If that's not too idealistic, as a. And thanks, Paul, for <laughs> for your comment. We haven't seen each other for such a long time. I will never forget that uh, Paul Katz um, showed me once um, the first stretch I ever saw in uh, Vermont at the uh, Marlboro Music Festival. And uh, you came and brought this uh, Strat cello and showed it to me and it was uh, opened the whole world for me. And um, now I, I play uh, a Strat myself and I'm, I'm very lucky. But I think the early inspiration was definitely this, this one meeting in Mar Marlboro. It must have been in 19, uh, 1987 or something ridiculously long ago. So here's another question from Eskar. I hope your name, I, I pronounced your name correctly. Can you discuss the difference in sound construction between the different registers on the cello. I frequently find I have to depart from a different starting point depending that. Correct. Very correct. The A string is definitely our most sensitive string. If you play Don Quixote by Strauss mm. and you start with a little too much pressure on the G C string for that beginning. <laughs> there's no disaster will happen because it's actually incredible how much attack a C string can take without sounding terribly ugly. That is very different from the A string. The A string, we have to be kind of... So when I want to play loud on an A string, I have to be more careful. Imagine a violin. You take a violin and you try with your cello bow or a violin bow, you will scratch so much as a cellist. I tried many times, uh, very unsuccessfully. So when you when you go to a higher string, you got to be a bit more careful, especially with pressure and attacks, to design them in a way that they help you, but that they don't kill the sound. And the lower string can take more and more attack for sure. And also for clarity, I would suggest stronger attacks on lower uh, on lower strings. For example. Uh, when you play the theme in Brahms. Uh, the, the, we would not uh, play so many attacks on that theme, but when the same thing comes on the C string. You can be quite, um, quite strong and can attack the string quite a bit and release in between because articulation will help you on the lower strings to make it clear and speaking. Jason, how do you find the sound you want in the absence of explicit instructions marking such and as Bach suites? Well, I think Bach suites are um, I, a lot of uh, references help me. I mean, we are in the lucky position that we my teacher, Heinrich Schiff, made one of the most beautiful recordings of Bach. So when I studied with him, uh, producing a sound like he did for Bach suites was for me some some dream. So it, it inspired me very much. I also listened to Anna Bilsma on a Baroque cello. That was a bit more rigid, but in an incredibly pure and uh, uh, tasteful and stylish way. And of course, I listened to Casals too. And Casals had that strength in Bach, that spine and incredible. Um, he was never afraid of having Bach sound strong and and um, 
yeah, almost uh, with, a, with a certain aggression sometimes, which uh, made me think that Bach has an, a lot of energy in his music. So, so references help me a lot with, with uh, and I think your generation, you have the greatest library on earth with YouTube and, and whatever, Spotify, you can listen to anyone and you can find so many references. And I find it's very important to um, uh, clearly to make sure uh, you listen to your references and sort them out. You say, oh, I listened to this recording of Bach of such and such, and it wasn't my cup of tea. Yeah. So let's say you listen to, to my recording of Bach, say, well, I'm, I imagine a more high, higher register sound. I looked in my Bach for lower, darker sound. So everybody can choose, but I think uh, references are very important. And I think for Bach, I, for example, I, ref I highly re uh, recommend Heinrich Schiff, Anna Bilsma and Casals as like for me the th three kind of for my my life mo maybe most important Bach recordings. Uh, Jazer, uh, what kind of bows do you play? Do you use a rock bow as well? How do you adjust your playing based on the different bows you play? Well, I'm very lucky. I have two bows. This is a, a Dominique Picat bow, which is very strong. It has. <laughs> So it's very clear when I play something. So it's, it jumps very well. It has this clarity. It's very sportive in a way. And I have a, a Francois Totbo, which is uh, from the sound you can't beat. Uh, it has it, it pr uh, produces a longer and more beautiful sound and it opens the cello in a in a magical way. But I have played um, a long time until about 15 years ago German bows, um, and I was very happy with them too. And I think what's important, you have to find out, do you like a softer bow, softer stick, a uh, harder stick or heavier bow or lighter bow? And this you will find out pretty soon from your playing style, also from your instrument you choose. Mm -hmm. And uh, you will find your likings and maybe you write it down so you really system systematically look for the bow that has the weight and the flexibility you uh, for your playing uh, seek. And uh, I like uh, stronger bows, also pretty heavy. They're all around 80 grams, my bows. And that comes also from the fact that I play a lot of concertos and I have to produce large sounds. And I like to produce large sounds, so uh, my bows are pretty strong, but uh, that's just um, one thing. I have used a Baroque bow. I have one somewhere in the, one of those uh, drawers over there. And I have recorded on a Baroque cello. It was very hard for me with gut strings. It was a very important um, uh, lesson to be learned. And I played even my first triple, I mean, triple concerto on gut strings. I played with a Baroque bow or classical bow. I played Vivaldi and pop rock concertos on Baroque bow. But uh, I have to say um, it's it's a quite a transition, but I can suggest it very much as an exercise to learn more about your bow arm and about your contact with the cello. Uh, you will come back and notice you can lose, use even much less pressure for a gut string or for a baroque bow than you use for a modern bow. Um, John, question from John. I, I find searching for new colors very intimidating uh, since there are so many variables you could change. You mentioned a systematic way to find different contact points. Is there a systematic way to explore colors in, in one's playing? Yes, there is. Um, the, I think what you what you want is you have markings in the part. And since we play mostly classical composers of, um, let's say we play Beethoven. Beethoven is incredibly particular with markings. Markings, and um, many of the markings already suggest certain colors. So um, a forte piano, for example, in the G minor sonata. It's really a forte and a piano. So already. It suggests a lot. And if we can execute what he wrote, we are pretty good. We have a great color. Then he writes Piano Espressivo for... I can hardly imagine this phrase being not very mellow, very um, soft from the texture with a nice animated vibrato to show the espressivo. So, so I think go with the text. For me, the text suggests a lot of colors. And when the color is, when you understand what co co color the composer suggests with the text and with the markings, you have a much easier time to translate it into cello. Then when you translate it, you use what we talked about 
you try to find out, okay, a more mellow sound will not be on the A string near the bridge because that will be a very bright sound. So a more mellow sound, for example, in this theme in Beethoven Sonata, will be on the D string, right? So we know already it's on the D string. We want to have a singing sound. We, we Our contact list is not too low, again, because as Pasivo, not too much pressure. And we produce a mellow, melancholic sound in mezzo piano, our bow speed not too high. So really try the variations between bow speed and contact points for the different colors. Once you have defined the color, search for it. I do this all the time. I never know where it is. It's not that I know always where the color is. I, I don't get a color. I try again. I change my bow speed. I change my contact point. I change my vibrato speed often. Vibrato speed is a big key to, to color. Um, and then maybe I get it at some point. Maybe I never find exactly the color I have in the ear for the marking I'm reading, but that's a process and your the composer is your big help. So please observe the markings and try to translate them into um, your interpretation. I hope that answers your question a little bit. Those subjects are all universal and one could talk about each of your question an entire hour without any problem and without any boredom. But <laughs> unfortunately, this is a pretty condensed um, um, you know, chat we are having about a, a very substantial um, uh, subject, sound. <laughs> Comment from Wendy Law. Ah, hi, Wendy. Hi, Jan. So nice to see you here. Yes, nice to see you, Wendy. <laughs> so, um, Patricio, uh, any non-standard piece that you are very fond of, solo cello or cello and piano? Oh, I just um, discovered a sonata by Czech composer Miroslav Kabelac. And I recorded it. It will come out at some point. It's a beautiful sonata, one of the great sonatas of the 20th century. Nobody plays it. Um, Non-standard pieces, solo cello. Non-standard. Well, I'm also very fond of a composer called Enrique Casals. He was the brother of Pablo Casals. I just recorded his cello concerto, which also is never recorded, so it's going to come out also at some point. It's a wonderful concerto, really long, very virtuosic and melancholic also. It is a, it's a really great piece. And he wrote also, I believe, a solo suite. So check that out. I think Louis Claret plays it on YouTube. Uh, uh, en Enrique Casals, the brother of the famous Pablo Casals, wrote um, some solo suite and I think it's on YouTube and um, I, I would just out of the blue suggest those, but there are many. <laughs> um, what do you enjoy most about practicing? What inspires you? Is it classical or are there inspirations uh, outside the genre? Well, I really love practicing now and I didn't used to love it when I was younger. And I think um, what I try to do when I practice, I try to change strategy. So I focus on one thing and as even if I don't get very far, at some point I change my focus. I never get stuck with something. When I uh, when I feel like the Bach is not developing today, I move to the Elgar. The Elgar is not doing well, or the first movement is not doing well. I go to the second movement. I come back to the first movement. Maybe I have a different approach in the afternoon. And uh, I usually stop practicing when I have achieved something in the day. So I felt good about something, then I stopped. So it can be two hours, it can be three hours, it can be 20 minutes actually, in fact. So um, I, I like to uh, call it practicing with changing focus. So with, with really, with a moving mind that tries to cover lots of subjects and not to single out any, um, any uh, one subject. Uh, what's your... There are many questions. So, uh, in your mind, what makes an effective uh, practice? The first thing I do on the cello every day is the C major scale, and I try to focus on complete accuracy of co bow coordination, bow coordination with left hand. So. And so forth. Then I do. And then I do the six, and then I have a few uh, exercises for four yards. So it's about 15 minutes altogether. It's a little routine everybody has. And um, also many questions. I, what is the first thing you do on the cello? I said, what's on music tape right now? Yeah, Dvorak Elgar and some Bach suites for Paris. So I'm uh, on my way back from Hong Kong. I fly to Paris and play a couple of Bach suites. Um, 
and um, that's enough for me. Now it's just Elgar and Bach, but it's, I'm I'm busy with it. <laughs> and what's your favorite way to change things up, get new ideas? Well, the most favorite thing is to think how small our classical music is compared to all the music there is. And so to really think that um, sometimes we are in our own way because we get hung up about such details and and why not change everything? So let's say tomorrow you go on the channel and say, okay, everything I try today, I don't do today. I try everything different and see if it sounds better. So to change things up in a big way every day, I think I would really suggest because when I was younger, I got always stuck on something and that was the most horrible feeling. I, 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 I was kind of in a narrow kind of way and these, way, these days I always try to to open the, the walkway and try something new. And I tape myself a lot on my phone and I listen to it, no, no matter how brutal it is. And I watch myself and I want to see if I execute it in a way I think I execute it. And often I see I'm not, <laughs> especially the bow, bow distribution. This is a thing I love to work on always to see a perfect bow distribution and a perfect planning with your bow to know exactly how much bow on which contact place you use for every note and if it's efficient or not. So um, what's the best way to prevent injury? Yeah, never do. Uh, I mean, as the doctor says, when when a patient says, oh, when I press here, doctor, then it hurts. Then a good doctor usually says, then don't press here. So um, don't do anything that hurts. If something hurts, it's not right. Don't push. If I play the cello, I sit straight, I have my shoulders down. I'm generally relaxed. I put my left hand on it. It's a pretty natural thing. It's not like violin where we have to move our arm like this to get even to the position. And when we put our bow arm on it, and if we are relaxed here, our thumb is round uh, wherever we put it. This is another whole discussion. Is round and flexible, can move, and our index finger can actually move, and the other fingers are flexible and holding holding the bow and help us to to have stability. It's a pretty natural thing. Nothing should hurt. If something hurts, stop and think and think what you're doing wrong. Often we block our shoulders. Uh, sometimes we block our elbow. Our elbow should flow naturally. Uh, the closer we come to the um, tip, the elbow has to rise. As we know, the underarm has to come out. So, so what your arm, ask your teacher what you can do better in technical um, settings, but don't play when it hurts. It should not, cello playing should not hurt. Um, practice a method you that you swear by that remains a constant value of over the years a go-to strategy yeah I like to um, do things with rhythms so when I have a run that I want to practice I change the rhythms and that's something always helps because it uh, changes your reaction speed and uh, if you change the rhythm, uh, your fingers have to react faster in an un unexpected way. And that helps always your um, left hand technique. And for right arm, as I said, I try to visualize my bow as a sculptural tool and try to really have sound sculptures that are expressed by precise uh, bow movements that I plan and then try to uh, make natural over the over the time. Uh, what's the best way to prevent injury? When do you feel the most inspired in the practice room? When I when I have some findings, I think we are like scientists. We are uh, definitely not. Um, uh, I would say we are not robots. We are not machines. We are not mechanics. I think we are artists. And when we find something new, whether it's a new expression or a new way to play a phrase, it's art. So we should think confidently about it that in the practice room, we are artists with a canvas trying to paint something. We should not think we are just craftsmen. If we are just craftsmen, I think I would have chosen a different profession. I would have maybe worked with something more dynamic where I can walk around and uh, don't have to be stuck on one place. So I feel to, to we are more scientists and we are artists. And so somewhere between that exploration process and the findings in the imagination to create a certain sound. That's where I have my biggest fun uh, in the practice room. Doesn't happen every day. I can tell you that much. Um, what is your balance between technique and repertoire? Well, I I have to be in a good shape. So when I go, go on stage like this weekend with Dwarja Concerto, I know in the first rehearsal if my shape is good enough or not. If my shape is not good enough, I do more exercises. 
if my uh, shape is good enough, I practice the piece. But uh, you will come to the situation once in a while when you go to the first rehearsal with an orchestra, play a concerto, and you feel like a little bit just under my kind of sportive performance level, then you just got to play maybe an hour of scales. And if you do this for two, three days, you will catch up and you will be fine, I think. And this usually, uh, it's a matter of observation. Uh, how do you manage lots of repertoire at the same time? I always loved lots of repertoire. Always when I even 18, I had always two sonatas and a caprice and a concerto and I to switch and play chamber music. and. If somebody, if conductor asks me, say, oh, can you play Shostakovich second concerto uh, next March? And I have in February already Shostakovich one. I will never ask the conductor to say, oh, no, can we do number one? Because I'm playing number one already a few weeks earlier. I would definitely accept the challenge and play the second concerto. So I love to switch up repertoire and think about the improvement of repertoire rather over decades. So after 40 years, I think my Dvorak improved. <laughs> I hope so, at least. And I think... Um, but I don't like to play the whole season. I, I like to play it once in a while and then play some other concerto in between, maybe Schumann or Don Quixote, and then come back to the Dvorak, maybe in the end of the season, and try to remember what I didn't like about my last performance. So switching repertoire for me is rather a plus than a minus. How, um, uh, how has your practicing evolved over the years of even recently? I mean, anything that surprised you? Yeah, I think I practiced terribly as a young person, terribly. I always wanted this perfection and I didn't let the honesty come into the practice room. So I didn't let real results happen. And often it's when you practice, you really have to be go step by step and you have to accept that something might not sound that good, that might be necessary to get to the next step. And I was always looking for quick results. And now I realize I love the process of practicing a week a piece and after the week noticing the piece got so much better. So um, I, I give it time. I know what I have to do to improve it. And I trust that overnight when I do this and I sleep a night on it, tomorrow it will be better. So I trust that the hours I put in with certain practice techniques will bring me to a better place. And that's a lot of fun for me now. I think I practice exponentially better. I'm still not happy with my practicing. I can practice better, but I'm happier than um, uh, 30 years ago. I can tell that much. <laughs> um, uh, with such a big workload, how do you avoid burning out and maintain balance? Well, I feel actually I love the cello just as much as I used to love it when I was a child. There's no burning out of love, I think, in life. We Love is something that doesn't die if it's if it's real. And for me, the cello, I have always loved playing the cello for other people or for myself and touching the strings, touching with the left hand. I, I know some of you might know the feeling. I love touching the string with the left hand and I love, love, love to kind of... Uh, kind of get get to get to know the cello and to be friends with the cello so that's uh, for me i don't really burn out but um, i feel absolutely important if you do feel burnt out take a walk that's the best re recipe go in the park see nature if we can play like nature like a wind in the uh, like a tree in the wind if we can have that kind of motion in our uh, music in a Brahms sonata or something, that kind of life, liveliness, uh, how a tree bends in the wind. So nature is the biggest inspiration. So if you feel burnt out, lots of nature, I suggest, and less practice room. Uh, if there, we haven't discussed that you feel vital or productive, creative or practice. Is there anything you feel contributes most of this? How do you practice a new piece, a different when you're learning? Yes, new pieces to practice is actually the first days for me always quite a torture because I love to get to the stage where I can play it and then apply imagination. But the first days, I have a certain technique that might be the most idiotic technique, but it works for me. Uh, with a new piece, since I have no reference to it, as let's say it's a world premiere, um, I'm going to play a new piece uh, in next April at Carnegie Hall. I have not even seen the score. Once I see the score, I will just read it through on the cello and play it through as good as I can in a slower speed and do that a couple of times again and again. I just play it through and I let slowly the thought come to me. What is this piece about? 
where are the solutions and I let the piece answer to me. So I don't do anything so active in the beginning. I just play it through for three days or so until the piece comes to me and shows me, ah, okay, it's about that and that. And then I take particular passages and then I go into detail and then I, I put it together. But I need this overview. So I kind of go really very pedestrian through the piece uh, for, for a few days until I feel what it's all about. Um, but it's a very good question. Thank you. I, I think that marks the end of the questions. If you can give any closing remarks, I would absolutely like to uh, give some closing remarks. It was fun to do this. For some reason, I felt uh, all of you um, there. So uh, thank you for uh, tuning in. And uh, my closing remarks would just be uh, never give up on yourself in terms of sound. Always aspire to have a sound that you you want to have and everyone I think can for a short piece sound like a great cellist if you aspire to do so. The hard part is perhaps to sustain it throughout a lot of complicated repertoire and to couple it with a lot of other elements but I think cello sound is something I feel everybody can learn and everybody can make a very beautiful sound and personal sound so don't give up on yourself and put the standard very high and um, never, never believe there, there is anything in the way of you having the most beautiful sound on the cello. So that's my, my closing remark. And thank you all for tuning in. And um, thank you, William, for hosting and uh, Paul for creating this uh, venture. And um, I'm, I think this is very helpful for everyone and uh, was fun for me. Thank you. <laughs>